Welcome to this master class on finance management. I want to congratulate you on your decision. I think this step can go a long way in improving your business profitability, sustainability and will benefit you in more ways than you can imagine right now. Folks, I've been doing this for a number of years. This is a hobby turned passion turned full-time activity for me now. I was a practicing chartered accountant. And today we train a large number of companies globally. Our client list exceeds well over 2,000 companies, from very, very large companies to medium scale to small scale businesses. And what I have seen is tremendous. The transformation, the turnaround that has happened, because it's not funny how many businesses in the world fail because of bad finance management. There are many examples of small and large companies that have undergone my training programs. But one particular company comes to mind which has over 120,000 employees and I am training about 90,000 of them. I hold many live sessions over there from one day to five day residential programs. I have created almost 50 e-learning modules which are running on the intranet site. They have taken licenses for all my videos. Many, many books, a few thousand books are lying in their various libraries across many countries. And this company is so aware about the need for finance management, good finance management, because they realize the price the organization can pay due to bad finance management practiced by those people who call themselves non-finance persons. So their method is anything any employee needs from the company, they first demand, have you done the finance program? Please bring a certificate of the e-learning program. Everybody is permitted to opt to attend the various programs that get announced on their intranet. And I think they are reaping the benefits of good finance management. Besides large organizations, there are a number of small-scale unit owners, proprietors who have benefited from finance training. Before they attended these programs, before they imbibed the rules of good finance management, they didn't realize what's going wrong with their organization. The business is there, they have orders, the production goes on, and despite that, profitability was not good. They were always facing a cash crunch. In fact, right now, since there is a bit of recessionary condition going on, all those students, all those clients, all those organizations who have undergone these programs and who are following the principles taught to them are surviving, are still doing well. And those who are flouting the rules are the ones who are paying a price. I hope you enjoy the masterclass. Feel free to write to me. I'll be very happy to answer any queries that you have. Why are some people always prosperous and others in trouble? How is it that some people always have money to splurge, whereas others are perpetually short? Even if your business is doing well, why is it that you have problems of cash when some important payments have to be made? The answer to all these questions lies in your ability to manage finance. Are you a non-finance person? Chances are if you are an entrepreneur with a technical background or if you are an employee in charge of production or if you take care of marketing or sales or HR, chances are your answer will be yes. And I think not a single person amongst you can afford to say that you are a non-finance person. Now this raises an interesting question. You are saying you are non-finance. I am saying you should not say so. The problem seems to be in the definition, how you are defining who a finance person is and how I seem to be defining. So let's discuss this a bit. What do I mean you're all finance persons? Nobody should say finance management is not my job. Who is a finance person? Is it the job of a finance person to track financial information, to collect financial data, 
to record that information, to collate that information, to prepare financial statements like profit loss accounts and balance sheets? Answer is no. That is accounting. Had my question been whether you are a non-accounting person, then if your answer had been yes, I would have agreed with you. But if collecting, recording, presenting financial information is not finance management, then what is finance management? Let me give you my definition now. I think finance management is the ability on the part of every individual in the organization to understand the financial implication of everything that person does. You must be familiar with the financial jargon called bottom line. Bottom line refers to the bottommost figure in a financial statement called profit loss account, which is either a profit or a loss. I think the ability on the part of every individual in the organization to understand the impact on the organization's bottom line of every action of that person is what finance management is. And why should everybody understand how their actions are going to impact the bottom line? So that as far as possible, every individual does those things that has a positive impact on the bottom line and avoids doing things that has a negative impact. And folks, if this is what finance management is, then I think every individual in the organization whose actions have the power to affect the bottom line is a finance person. So if I ask you once again, how many of your actions impact your organization's bottom line, I think every hand will go up. And then when people like you say, I am a non-finance person, I kind of interpret that answer to be, you are saying, I don't care how my actions will affect my organization's bottom line. But that's ridiculous. You should be doing nothing without first understanding are you impacting the bottom line positively or are you hurting it? Do everything that has a positive impact, do nothing that hurts the bottom line. If I take a simple example, an HR person will say, I'm a non-finance person, but every action of the HR person has a financial implication. What is the salary that you are offering? How many people should you hire? Each of these has a financial implication. The purchase manager, the materials manager, again, no action should be taken by that person without understanding the impact on the bottom line. The amount of inventory to be maintained, the terms on which to be purchased, each have a financial implication. A salesperson standing in the field meets a potential customer who promises to place a very large order but asked for a price which is probably 60% of the offered price. This person is expected to say yes or no to the customer standing in the field. The moment the salesperson says yes or no, has he taken a sales decision or has he taken a financial decision? Folks, what I'm trying to tell you is, everything that every individual in your organization does has a financial implication. Either it positively impacts the bottom line or it hurts the bottom line. When do organizations make a profit? Organizations make a profit when a larger percentage of people are doing things that have a positive impact and lesser people are hurting it, vice versa, the organization makes a loss. Much of what happens in the finance department is accounting. Whose actions generate profit for the organization? It is the actions of the production person, the sales person, the purchase person. If their actions are financially intelligent, the accounts department will say, we have made a profit. If their actions are financially deficient, the accounts department will say, we have made a loss. Folks, I often compare the running of a business to a game. Let's say there's a game of soccer or a game of cricket being played. Whose actions make you win the game? Is it the actions of the players on the field or is it the actions of the scorekeeper? The scorekeeper is a very important person. The match would become meaningless minus the scorekeeper. But scorekeepers do not make you win the game. Game is won by the actions of the players. An organization makes a profit if the actions of those people who call themselves non-finance are financially intelligent. Financial literacy has to go across the organization. Not a single person can afford to say, I am a non-finance person. Non-finance person is an oxymoron. So unless financial literacy seeps across the organization, the organization's finance management cannot be good.
Profit is the result of financially intelligent decisions collectively taken by the organization as a whole. Some people within your organization are doing things by which your bottom line is getting strengthened. Others are doing things which are hurting the bottom line. When do organizations make a profit? Profit is the result when a larger percentage of the people have done things that have a positive impact on the bottom line and lesser people have hurt it, vice versa, the organization makes a loss. But can you imagine an organization where everybody consciously only does those things that has a positive impact? What an amazing organization would that be? A study was once conducted of all the failed businesses in the world. The idea was to find out why do businesses fail. Now, normal thinking would be certain cases, technological issues could cause failures, outdated technology might be used, or the person knew how to make a product but did not know how to sell. Sometimes labor problems can contribute to business sickness. But the study found all these reasons put together were not responsible for even 5% of business failures in the world. Recent history has said not only businesses have failed, but entire economies and countries have failed due to bad finance management. The entire subprime crisis of the United States can be attributed solely to bad finance management. Countries in Europe, Greece, Portugal, Spain are right now paying the price of bad finance management. But what does it mean? What does it mean when I say that most businesses fail due to bad finance management? I will tell you what it means to me. If somebody came to me and said, you know, I went sick. Why? I became technologically obsolete. I don't understand how to blame that person. Suddenly, this poor fellow finds in front of him, a giant has sprung up as a competitor. This giant is miles ahead in technology. In comparison, this person's technology is out of date and he does not have the money to buy new technology. How, how do you blame him? If somebody comes to me and says, I went sick because of labor problems, sympathies go out to that person. But when somebody says, my business failed because of financial mismanagement, I think the responsibility lies solely on that person's shoulders. Why did this business go sick? Because the real finance people in the organization said we are non-finance persons. And most people who call themselves finance people were doing accountancy. Folks, who is doing finance management? So if finance management causes so much of grief, if bad finance management is responsible for so many business failures in the world, then it is obvious every organization must practice good finance management. And when this question is posed to me, my reaction used to be that I'm sorry, good finance management is not a two line definition. It's a whole subject. It's a whole philosophy. It takes years to learn. And then I used to feel the unfairness of it all. What am I doing? I am first communicating to you how important the subject is. I am perhaps creating in you a desire that I am willing to take the efforts to learn so that I can make a difference to my organization. And when you say I'm willing and I'm ready, I say, I'm sorry, I have no answers for you. I used to wonder, can I give you a magic formula? You want to practice good finance management from tomorrow. Here is a magic formula. Do this. Good finance management will happen. Obviously, there are no magic formulae. But what I have is something pretty close to that. I have condensed what I think is the essence of good finance management and I present it in the form of two rules. We can call them the two golden rules of good finance management. My complete conviction is if you understand these two rules, if you internalize these two rules, if you promise me never to violate these two rules, I will promise you most problems that others suffer from on account of bad finance management, you will not. These are not standard rules. These are my rules. But you bring me a sick company's balance sheet and I will tell you which of the two rules is violated. Or if they had not violated these two rules, this organization would not be a sick company.
so called non finance persons are convinced what is there to understand in profit profit is the result you must know how to make and you must know how to sell i am not disagreeing with this at all i am not at all underestimating the importance of the ability to make and sell i am assuming that to be a given folks if profit was the automatic result of ability to make and sell then two organizations that know how to make and know how to sell equally well should they not be making the same profit it will never happen pick up any two organizations pick up two hotels of the same size pick up two car manufacturers pick up two it companies similar size same manpower similar products similar cost similar selling price not only will they not be making the same profit chances are one of them is making a profit and the other one makes a loss why because profit is a result of finance management and here i have three drivers of profit what does profit depend upon in addition to making and selling i think profit is the result of number one cost of capital number 2 the proportion between performing and non performing assets and number 3 how long will performing assets perform throughout the year now each of these deserves elaboration of running into at least an hour to two hours but folks once you understand these three things my guarantee is you can probably not only improve but maybe double your profitability with existing sales and now if you focus on increasing the sales you will find bottom line being affected exponentially very often when i explain the principles of finance management and i tend to kind of make it sound pretty easy not that it isn't easy because i think the entire subject of finance management is a common sense subject it's not rocket science but when i make it sound probably easier than it is the natural reaction of the person listening is if this is so easy how is it so many people fall victims to bad finance management don't they understand my answer is number one yes they don't understand it's not funny how much ignorance exists about the subject but folks even if they understand the problem is far more deep rooted very often there is ignorance if the ignorance is not there you will find organizations do not generate the relevant data the right mis is not in place if the data is generated it's not timely if it is timely it doesn't reach the right person within the organization if it reaches the right person that person is not trained to read understand interpret and take actions based on that folks this is such a deep rooted problem that if organizations get into trouble it was a matter of time before they had to get into trouble there is no substitute for financial literacy and therefore even if your finance department even if the finance department in your organization is the best in the world the organization can still get into deep financial problems because finance management is happening outside the finance department unless entire organization is financially literate unless financial intelligence seeps through the entire organization your finance management cannot be at its optimum one thing every business person realizes very very early after starting a business is that there is no connection whatsoever between the profit that the business makes and the bank balance that it possesses or let's say there is a connection i think there is an inverse relationship the greater the profit the higher the profit that you make the lower the bank balance that you possess and this bothers a lot of people accountants tell me there is so much profit we made so much profit why don't i see it in the bank right now i don't have the time to elaborate on this statement but take my word for it this is something that bothers most business people where is the money is a statement that comes from the bottom of the heart of most entrepreneurs 
Accountants tell us so much turnover, so much profit has been made, but where is the money? Why don't I have money in the bank to pay salaries this month? And what happens when an organization makes a healthy profit? Folks, profits raise expectations. The moment you make a profit, you will find a line of people standing outside your door like this with their palms outstretched. Number one, employees would be waiting. If your organization has made a handsome profit, they have a major contribution in that. They would be waiting to get a bonus. The government of the country is also expecting to be paid income tax. The shareholders of the organization are waiting for dividends. All the profit that you make you will be forced into distributing amongst these three interested parties. And profit does not mean money. And therefore, sometimes an organization gets into trouble because it had made profits. Some organizations get into trouble because they don't make profit. Others get into trouble because they make the profit. Because they knew how to make profits, but they did not know how to handle cash flow. Or in my opinion, Successful organizations stand on two pillars. Pillar number one, ability to generate profit. And pillar number two, ability to effectively manage cash flows. And the responsibility for both lies on every individual because no individual is a non-finance person. Finance management is a result of financially intelligent actions taken by everybody within an organization. And what do I mean by financially intelligent actions? You must understand the impact of your action on the organization's bottom line and you must understand the impact on the cash flow. Every penny that a business spends needs to be recovered. Whether you spend money on salaries or you spend money on acquisition of a building or a machinery, that money has to be recovered. The only thing is, every penny does not have to be recovered today. There is certain money that you will spend today, which you will say, I want to recover it today. Those items are called expenses. But there is money spent on other items where you spend today and you say, yes, I want to recover, but what's the hurry? I don't mind spending money today and recover it, let's say, over an extended period of time. When you mentally agree to stagger the recovery, such items are temporarily called assets and every stage of recovery, every installment of recovery is called depreciation. And since the portion, a certain portion of money spent has not been recovered, you need a warehouse where to keep that item and the warehouse is called a balance sheet. A balance sheet is where the item stays till it can get transferred to the profit loss account as an expense. But please understand the ultimate destination of every penny spent is the expenses side of the profit loss account. Nirvana will only happen when the item has been transferred to the profit loss account. In the meantime, the item is in a state of animated suspension, which is called an asset. Lazy assets are the most expensive. Assets take holidays, liabilities don't. No banker says, you don't work on a Sunday, no need to pay me interest for that day. Convert your non-performing assets to performing. Sweat your assets. Else, sell them, release the money, bring it back into circulation. A question that bothers most business people is, whether they should fund their activities using debt capital or equity. Most entrepreneurs understand that debt comes at a cost. But many people neglect to understand that equity also has a cost. In fact, equity capital not only has a cost, it is perhaps the most expensive source of money available. If the banker has lent the money on the expectation of earning interest, the owner also expects to get something. In fact, the banker does not take risks. He gets the security of assets. The owner sticks his neck out. 
and therefore not only owners expect profit but their expectations have to be substantially greater than the expectation of a banker if i give you a textbook answer what are the consequences of raising money by way of debt versus equity three factors need to be taken into account number 1 cost factor number 2 the risk factor and number 3 the control factor from the cost point of view i think equity is the most expensive so debt would be preferable from the risk point of view debt comes with an obligation to service it whether you make profit or not and with an obligation to be repaid equity does not have to be repaid and therefore from a risk factor equity is more attractive and the third factor to be taken into account is control if you are the promoter of a business and you hold a certain percentage of your shares which is higher than the others and therefore you are a de facto owner and if you wish to raise more money and if that extra money come by way of equity effectively your control decreases because now there are larger number of shareholders the equity capital has gone up your amount of investment remains the same and therefore your control gets diluted but had you raised this money by way of debt the control remains unaffected so from the cost point of view debt is cheaper from the control point of view again debt is more attractive because it does not dilute control but from a risk perspective equity is better because it does not have to be repaid nor is there an obligation to service it you must take all these factors into account before you decide the proportion between debt and equity since there is no obligation to service equity since dividend is not a compulsion it sometimes gives the impression that it is free but the truth is equity is not free let's take the point of view of number 1 a public limited company number 2 a proprietary concern in a public limited company the shareholders have expectations and companies cannot afford to let them down if you do not reward the shareholders if you do not meet their expectations next time you will have a problem raising equity so you are now committed in a way to meet the market expectations which very often is laid down by the analysts and so on but what if you are not a public company what if you are a proprietary concern now does your money have a cost now the perspective can change why did the proprietor invest money in this business if the proprietor does not invest in this business this person could easily have kept it in a bank and earned a certain amount of interest this person could have invested in bonds and earned a higher rate of return this person could have made some riskier investments gone to stock markets perhaps and raised even higher returns now do you think this person will ever invest in the business unless the proprietor is absolutely confident what i will earn in the business is higher than what i can earn elsewhere so let's say elsewhere this person can earn somewhere between 5-7% on safe investments and 10 to 15% on risky investments Do you think this person will invest in the business unless he thinks the business can earn for me greater than that? And when money is invested in banks, in bonds, in stock markets, who is working? The money is working. This person is absolutely free. But when the proprietor invests money in the business, he not only invests money, but he starts working from morning eight o'clock to evening nine o'clock, and in the process invites blood pressures, ulcers, and so on. Does he not deserve a certain percentage for his health? Whichever way you look at it, folks, unless a business can earn a return which is substantially greater than the return on relatively safe investments. the proprietor will never invest in the business and i think that percentage could be anywhere between 20 to 30% at least but when i make a statement like this don't invest in businesses unless you can earn a 20 to 30% return very often people listening to this get up and ask me a question can you show us such a business where the returns are so high let's say i want to start a new business i want to start trading in hardware i buy laptops for 10000 
I said you must not invest money in your business unless you can earn on your own investment a minimum 20 to 30 percent. So what is my suggestion? When should I invest my own money in this business? Only when I can sell these laptops for a minimum 13,000. But I cannot. It's a very, very competitive line. I will be lucky if I can sell these laptops for 10,100. The question now is, does this business deserve my money? Should I put my money in this business or should I put it outside in bonds, in stock markets? Imagine I have got 20,000 to invest. So I buy two laptops of 10,000 each. I buy them for 10,000 each. I mark them up to 10,100 and I sell them. I sell these two laptops. I release the money. I buy two more. Sell them. Release the money. Buy two more. Sell them. Release the money. Buy two more. End of the year, I find I've managed to sell 100 laptops. How much did I buy these laptops for? 1 million. How much did I sell them for? 1 million 10,000. How much profit have I made? 10,000. I bought these laptops for 1 million. I made a profit of 10,000. What is the percentage profit made by me? 1%. Should I put my money in this business or should I put it outside? Answer is invest in this business. Why? How much money did I invest? 20,000. And how much profit did I earn? 10,000. Folks, I have generated a return on investment of 50%. I am talking about return on investment. Should you know how to make a balance sheet? Can you spend a lifetime saying, I don't need to know how to make a balance sheet? Yes. If you spend your entire life without knowing how to make a balance sheet, no big deal. Can you afford to say, I don't need to know how to read a balance sheet? Folks, if you say so, if you think so, you will pay a price. Sooner or later, everybody realizes whether you are holding a responsible position within an organization or you are the owner of a business, everybody realizes my ability to lead successful businesses, my ability to perform my functions sensibly, intelligently depends on my ability to read balance sheets. And in order to learn how to read a balance sheet, you don't need to know how to make one. If a business has too much money in the bank, it is a sign of worry. Money in the bank is a non-performing asset. Checking accounts don't even generate interest. Businesses don't make profit by hoarding money. They make profits by deploying the money intelligently. Successful organizations not only deploy every penny that they receive, but they're very often planned where the money that they've yet to receive will be invested. I think shortage of money is characteristic of successful businesses. I'm not saying every business short of money is successful. That idiot who messes up his affairs will also be short of money. Shortage of money does not indicate success, but success is accompanied by shortage of money. Take stock of what you do all day. Make a detailed list of the activities that you perform each day. Study each of these activities and find out which of these can be delegated. Whatever can be delegated, please delegate. Free yourselves, free your time to do finance management. I think we do everything throughout the day except finance management. My suggestion is do nothing that you don't have to do. Delegate whatever is delegatable. Free yourselves to do finance management. And this habit of yours will bring enormous benefits. There may be times due to competition where you have to sell your product at a loss. Sell it at a loss if need be. But don't ever sell your product at a negative contribution. If your profit is negative and contribution is positive, as the volumes increase, eventually your profit will also turn positive. But if you sell the product at a negative contribution, the more you sell, the more you will lose.
ask someone who comes to you for investment advice tell me what is your objective would you like an investment which gives you a higher return or would you like safety of your capital pat comes the reply i want safety people choose investments on grounds of safety when they understand nothing about safety except its spelling If the finance management foundation of your business is weak the structure that you build on it will eventually collapse strive to become a financially intelligent organization your level of success depends on your level of financial intelligence and financial intelligence has to seep through the entire organization unless every individual in your organization is financially literate your organization cannot be financially intelligent once again i congratulate you on your decision to attend this master class on finance management and i'm sure it will go a long way in improving your profitability and sustainability i invite you to attend a four week online eight module program on finance management in which every week you will receive two videos which you can watch at your leisure and each week i will hold a private facebook live session in which you can interact with me ask me questions summarize and review what you have learned during the week in the first week the two modules will introduce you to the two most important financial statements the profit loss account and the balance sheet we will see what they contain we will demystify the contents of these two statements the second week i will teach you how to make a balance sheet one video will talk about how to make a balance sheet like an accountant and the other video will tell you even if you know nothing about accounting how you can still make a balance sheet third week we will take a closer look at the balance sheet we will understand the nuances and how to read what is contained in the balance sheet as well as the profit loss account and in the fourth week i will give you my two golden rules of good finance management these are rules created by me if you show me any sick company's balance sheet i will tell you which of these two rules have been violated and if you learn these two rules if you imbibe these two rules if you ensure never to violate these two rules you will be able to avoid most of the financial mismanagement related problems that others face if you enroll now you will get a very special prize for this program besides you will also get an invitation to join a private facebook group where you can interact with like minded people and others who have done similar programs and also get to chat with me besides we have advanced modules where we cover marginal costing and leverage analysis and how to evaluate financial statements through funds flow statements and ratio analysis and so on you will get a special prize for those programs also i look forward to having you in the program and also interacting with you during the live weekly sessions as well as on the private facebook group i am sure you will reap the benefits of good finance management